Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 3 for March the 19th, 2017. We're still in Unit 1 entitled God's Eternal Preserving and Renewing Love. Our topic for today taken from the Adult Quarterly is the joy of love. The joy of love. Our devotion reading comes out of 1 John chapter 4 uh, verses 16b through 21. Our background scripture comes out of the Gospel of John uh, chapter 15 verses 1 through 17 and we will be studying today from the 15th chapter of John uh, verses 1 through 17. Our key verse reads, This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. John 15, uh, 15 chapter verse 12 uh, from the King James Version. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to examine the role of love in human life and explore how God's love empowers and changes human love. The second aim is to express the joy that is found in keeping God's commandments to love others. <clears throat> and the third aim um, is to reflect the love of God in ministries and lifestyles that grow from being called to be disciples. We have just two outlines today that uh, we will focus on. Uh, the first outline is entitled The Necessity of a Divine Hookup. And the second outline is entitled The Commandment to Love One Another. I certainly thank and praise God for yet another opportunity to be able to share this lesson with you and we are prayerfully <clears throat> hoping that you are following uh, with us in these lessons. Uh, they teach us a lot and they help us a lot to continue to edify us uh, in terms of our relationship with the Lord and keep us uh, focused on His Word at all times. So we hope that you will continue to do that with us. I want to read some of the uh, biblical context that is associated with uh, our lesson quarterly. And then I want to read a little bit from our lesson standard. Merrill F. Unger describes the dynamic abiding relationship with Christ as follows. The believer's relation to Christ is here prefigured as that of union and abiding experience. The union would be affected by death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, and advent of the Spirit. I want you to look at Acts chapter 2 to baptize the believer into Christ. I want you to look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, and into his body, the church. You can see some reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 13. He further tells, in essence, that. Um, the Spirit came at Pentecost to accomplish the process of this union with Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see some reference in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 and Acts chapter 11 uh, verses 14 through 16. The experience of, ab of abiding is the result of knowing and reckoning in reality and experiencing the results of such a union which is fruit. A true vine says Unger, Jesus was the true Israel fulfilling the vocation in which the nation of Israel had failed. The branches are the new people of God, the church, from that union with Christ by baptism of the Spirit. This is taken from Merrill Unger's uh, Bible handbook. And so from our lesson standard, uh, today's lesson is from the section in the Gospel of John known as the Farewell Discourse of the Upper Room Discourses. Uh, you can see some reference in John chapters 13 through chapter 17. Uh, these consist of Jesus' teachings on the night before his crucifixion as he spent time with his disciples. It was a time of solemn Passover observance with friends. The result was a rich deposit of Jesus' teachings 
that is invaluable for our spiritual health today. You can see some reference about this Passover setting in Mark chapter 14 verse 15 and Luke chapter 22 uh, verse 12. Uh, these are the sources of the uh, designation of the upper room uh, although most of Jesus teaching in this location is found only in John's gospel so as we get into this lesson today we want to keep in mind that um, John chapter 15 uh, verses 1 through uh, 17 uh, we are talking about union with Christ and fruit bearing union with Christ and fruit bearing but I, I have to say uh, as we get started I was uh, as many times as I have read uh, John's gospel and particularly the 15th chapter what struck me this time was uh, you know in your Bible you may have a red letter edition uh, and most of what we will be uh, discussing today from John chapter 15 is in red uh, signifying the fact that Jesus is talking and I, I thought about that and and I just want to pose this question to, uh, to us today how do we feel about seeing Jesus talking or looking at all of this red print uh, from Jesus talking. I want to come back and touch on that a little bit but uh, the reason I, I, I raise that issue is because there's some implicate here in the 15th chapter of John that affect uh, the believer as well as the unbeliever and what really stood out to me is that we have the chance of a lifetime to get it right if you will to get to know Jesus in the part of our sins but make no mistake about it uh, Jesus has already declared the outcome of individuals who have not uh, remained or have not become connected with him I want you to keep that in mind and understand whatever has come out of the mouth of Jesus Christ certainly all of the uh, uh, of God's word is, is, is noteworthy but whatever has come out of the mouth of Jesus we need to pay special attention to that because we are setting the tone for the results uh, of our lives based on our adherence or the lack of adherence to what Jesus has said. We will come back and deal with that. But before we begin um, in John chapter 15 uh, beginning at verse 1 I want to go to John chapter 13 where this uh, upper room discourse uh, according to John uh, originates. And I just want to read one verse because we're talking about the joy of love but chapter 13 verse 1 the Bible says now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end I want you to think about that as we get into John chapter 15 it should be noted that the Gospel of John is also um, tagged as the so-called gospel uh, of belief the necessity of a divine hookup John chapter 15 um, verses 1 through 10 from the King James Version I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you verse 4 
Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what he will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. In verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. There's quite a bit here to uh, to unpack, but this analogy here John uses is taken from agriculture, uh, the vine and the branch relationship. Uh, it demonstrates um, that it is essential that we stay connected to Christ. The vine represents Christ and the branches represent all Christians. Just as the branches bear fruit by means of God's silent work in nature, we experience spiritual fruit when we entrust our lives to Him. To maximize productivity, God the Father is constantly in the process of tending to um, each branch. Local churches spend countless hours evangelizing and promoting programs to increase church attendance. In some respects, though, uh, subtraction from membership promotes quality growth. Uh, But God removes certain elements that impede growth and development in his churches. And in verse 3 suggests that Jesus' words have a cleansing effect. I want to just stop right there for a minute because this dialogue here if you will if you go back over to the 13th chapter as we read Jesus is giving some uh, fruitful instruction um, that his disciples may be able to uh, uh, grow or go forward with uh, after he departs But I want to focus on something here Uh, in verse 2. Jesus is talking about every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. No branch that is Christ can wholly can be wholly uh, fruitless, but branches that belong to Christ will bear fruit and undergo the pruning necessary to increase. The lack of fruit described, I want you to look at Psalm 80. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1 and Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 21. And so in these passages here, as we look at Israel, the nation of Israel, uh, the reason why that they were not uh, uh, able to bear fruit uh, from their relationship to God is because of their failure to be obedient to God. I want us to understand this. So the nation of Israel... Uh, found itself uh, in various wars. They found themselves in captivity. Uh, God had done, uh, particularly as we go look at uh, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1, 
uh, God had done everything that he could whereby Israel could be uh, 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 would be able to grow um, Israel was supposed to be uh, the evangelistic arm of God uh, but they were not able to make any progress because they did not uh, obey the commandments so these Old Testament discussions of the vine and its fruit combined with Christ's command to love in this chapter indicate that uh, fruit refers to a Christ-like life produced by the Holy Spirit rather than the number of people converted under a believer's ministry. And that's very important that we understand uh, if we want to uh, uh, grow not just in numbers but in spirit. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit uh, helps us to understand uh, such growth in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 um, in uh, verse 23 but uh, Jesus uses the word abide uh, it is repeated ten times uh, the metaphor of the vine illustrates the point uh, it is only when nutrients flow freely to the branches then f uh, that fruit can be born. So Jesus is emphasizing permanence and steadfastness in his relationship with his disciples. And that is the point that we want to be able to make here. Uh, we have to be steadfast in the word of God, steadfast in our relationship uh, uh, to Jesus Christ that we might be able to bear fruit. Uh, God dis did not establish us uh, as Christians that we don't produce any fruit of, of that relationship. This is all about uh, uh, our relationship. Uh, if, if you and I are in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, there should be fruit. So, uh, verse 6 from the 15th chapter. I just want to make a couple of points before we move on. Those that do not remain show that they uh, never had a saving relationship with Christ. Their destiny is described with the language of damnation. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 3 verse 12. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 in Jude's gospel verse 7 and Revelation uh, chapter 20 verse 14. That's what I meant earlier. These implications here uh, that, that are being solidified by Christ himself. It is in red. We need to take note of it. Uh, Jesus is calling attention to something that has eternal implications for all of us. If we are not careful, if we don't abide, uh, we will not be the type of uh, branches that God intends for us to be. Uh, he goes on to tell us here in the fifth verse of the 15th chapter that without me you can do nothing. Uh, the total inability of the unregenerate sinner makes saving grace absolutely necessary for the beginning, the development, and the completion of salvation. That's what we want to understand. Apart from Christ, we will not be able to make it. Apart from Christ, uh, we will not be able uh, to bear fruit. But it goes on to say, just as sustenance for the desired fruit comes uh, through the vine so does fullness of life come through faith in Jesus Christ we need to stay connected to Jesus the source of our power and fruitfulness many people try to be honest and do what is right but Jesus says that the only way to live a truly good life is to stay connected to him many times we have questions uh, about our lives and, and, and why we are not able to 
uh, to do better. Uh, you can see the hatred in the world. You can see uh, 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 the the factions in the church. We can see the discord amongst us as brothers and sisters. Why is that? If we are connected, why don't we love one another the way Christ intended for us? Uh, uh, and so all of us have a responsibility. As I was reading this lesson uh, and studying. Uh, the material, the word responsibility came out uh, that we ought to love one another. We have an obligation. Keep in mind, uh, in your Bible, all of this red that we have seen. Jesus is commanding. Jesus is talking. Jesus is instructing. Jesus is giving wisdom to his followers on how they should be and he reminds them as I read to you in John chapter 13 uh, verse 1 the Bible says he loved his disciples to the very end he has set the tone Jesus is our ultimate example of how and what love should be like amongst us as brothers and sisters we have no reason not to love one another uh, uh, not to forgive one another, not to keep the slate clean as believers, because Jesus said it, Jesus commanded it, Jesus told us, uh, and Jesus is is expecting us to do uh, what He has commanded. But I want to make a point about uh, some things that have happened to me, and I'm sure they have happened to you. Uh, and, and it's it's quite common that people wound us and injure us sometimes uh, in our families and even in the church. And I've heard this over the years that many of us say, I can't get past that. I can't get over that. That cut too deep. Uh, and so what we have to do in situations like that, what I did was I asked God to help me get over the wrong, to get past it, because it was a hurdle for me, if you will. It was an obstacle uh, in my faith. And so I know I can't remain bitter. I can't remain unforgiving uh, as a minister of Jesus Christ. So it is not uncommon for you and I to say, Lord, help me with myself and with the trial that I may get over the uh, the thing that was uh, uh, done to me that wasn't right that I may love my brothers and sisters as you have commanded I guarantee you God will help you get over it I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit will show you how to get past that trial we will never be able to uh, 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 totally remove every uh, uh, negative thing that comes up amongst us as brothers and sisters but we have a mandate uh, don't think that these disciples always saw eye to eye and they always got along with one another. That's not the case. Uh, but we do have a remedy and we do have an example even from Jesus at the cross. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I hope that I am impressing upon you uh, and sometimes that we try to do this in and of ourselves. But the Bible is clear. Jesus is telling me if you're trying to get past something without me, you're not going to be able to do it. If you're trying to do something in life uh, uh, without me, you're not going to be able to do it. If you're trying to move ahead uh, without me, you're not going to be able to do it. So he says, apart from me, ye can do nothing. That encompasses everything that we lay our hands to. Uh, without the enablement of the Holy Spirit, uh, God's power, we are not able to do anything. Uh, uh, we are not. Uh, we don't have the wherewithal to operate outside of God helping us. He created that dependency. He created that uh, uh, that ability that you could call on Him. He fixed it where you could call on Him. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, the Bible is clear from John's epistle, uh, I believe in the second chapter, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. I want you to keep that in mind. The mention of love in this context suggests that it is a primary, it is the primary uh, in the economy 
of Christianity. I gave you Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. But uh, this is not love in a general sense. Uh, rather it is agape love. When Jesus takes residence in our hearts. He brings and fills us with that powerful love. We are commanded to continue in God's love. Obeying God's command is essential if we are to experience God's love. Let me say that again. Obeying God's command is essential if we are to experience God's love. Jesus will not ask us to do what we cannot do. Therefore, he has set the example. He obeyed the Father's command, and we must do the same. It is a mandate from the Master. I just love these words, commanded, and uh, what we must do, and that it's essential. And all of these things speak to uh, uh, life itself, uh, and how we are able to co uh, function as a community. Uh, uh, it is so missing in the body of Christ these days that we have fallen short of our love we have everything else uh, but we don't have the bond the unity and the strength that we should have and that we could have if we simply just obeyed God it doesn't have to be it is not complicated uh, that, 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 that we do this uh, Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us to present our bodies as living sacrifices when you do that and surrender yourself uh, uh, to God he is able to equip you to do the things that are pleasing in his sight and I love this as we get uh, uh, a little bit further uh, uh, in this next outline it broadens the scope of our prayer life We'll talk about that in just a minute. But the question is asked here in the quarterly. Have you ever witnessed a plant or a flower with a severed branch? How did that branch fare? How did it look in relation to the other branches? You know, back over in that uh, Psalm 80 uh, that I referenced earlier. You know, you can see the nation of Israel in that passage the psalmist is crying out for restoration. The psalmist is crying out to be saved. Uh, Israel needed to be restored. Uh, they understood that, that the, the drought of their relationship with the Lord was costing them more than they can bear. And so they were crying out. And, 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 and even in Isaiah chapter 5, uh, if you read that uh God just asked the question, what more could I have done uh, for my beloved? What more could God have done in our lives to, 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 to bless us in such a way? Why have we withered spiritually? Why are we missing out on loving one another? What has happened to us? And certainly, where is the fruit uh, of our association with Jesus Christ? So, we don't look good. We don't feel good. Uh, we're not able to produce uh, the type of fruit that uh, uh, God is requiring of us. So, yes, I have witnessed it. Yes, I have seen uh, in my life where bitterness consumed me. Uh, I've seen in my life of uh, uh, unforgiveness ruling the day in my heart and in my mind. I have witnessed these things. I don't have to pick at anybody. I can look at them in the mirror uh, because I have seen the time when I've had to ask God to help me uh, or with myself because uh, I was in uh, a state of decline even in my faith. So these things can happen to the best of us and, and as we are aware of it even through the eyes of the gospel, then it opens up our prayer life, then we can get help uh, for ourselves. Don't ever think that, that uh, uh, you won't need God to assist you uh, in these matters. And so we are in a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. There is nothing uh, that he cannot hear uh, and help us with. Luke one thirty seven tells us there will be nothing impossible 
uh, for God. So keep those things in mind. Our second outline, the commandment to love one another. This is taken from John chapter 15, verses 11 through 17. And again from the King James Version. Uh, Jesus is still talking. It's still in red. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy, your joy might be full. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to, unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Verse 17, these things I command you, that ye love one another. Why is Jesus continuing to say this? Why is Jesus continuing to uh, uh, force this issue of commandment, love, abiding, fruit? Uh, why is he talking to his own in such a profound way? What is the significance of this passage that we should take away? Why was it so important that Jesus uh, uh, enforce these issues time and time again, uh, essentially repeating himself to men who have been with him, now have come to the point of him uh, leaving the earth, uh, being crucified? Why is he reiterating these things time and time again. This is the significance uh, of this relationship that he wants the world to see in us. It's what the world needs now, if you will, that we can show the world what it means to actually love. We don't have just the words, I love you. We have the deeds. We have the commandments. We have the power to do what the world is unable to, 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 to do. So this is a special uh, uh, appointment, if you will. These individuals, and certainly those of us that say we know the Lord, we have been chosen to do this. Uh, we have been commanded to go and to bring forth fruit. Um, we have been commanded to maintain fruitful relationships with one another. We have been commanded to retain these uh, loving relationships. We should not be comfortable with isolating ourselves from our brothers and sisters. We should not uh, regularly, as a norm, fail to greet one another, speak to one another. These set the vital tones for our interaction. If you and I don't speak to one another, we don't greet one another, we don't love one another, do you know we can't work together? We can't do anything. We can't show anybody. We can't evangelize. We can't do anything because the fundamental principles of that bond, of that relationship that certainly we should have had and we do have with Jesus Christ has been broken by our disobedient actions and we are not able to go forward even with one another. And so do you think we will be able to impress upon someone else to give their lives to Christ? Absolutely not. So this is uh, the heart and the meat of who we are as children of God. And I'm spending a lot of time here because Jesus is spending a lot of time here. And we need to reinforce these basics of our relationship and fellowship with one another. 
Do you notice how you don't feel good when you're at odds with your brothers and sisters? Do you think that's normal? Do you think it's normal that 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 uh, we go around each other and not speak to one another? Do you think that's normal? Show me biblically where the Lord told us to do that. So these are the things and the questions that uh, that I believe that Jesus is really uh, setting a tone for here and establishing with his disciples, making sure that they understand this is the fabric of their relationship. Uh, with him and with his father and so it is for the church so our divine commander in chief has given us to us a direct order to love one another he is not asking us to do what he has not done for he has loved and continues to love us unconditionally he gives us a glimpse into portions of his portfolio He declares that his love surpasses all others. He gave his life for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It goes on to say most of us have many acquaintances but very few friends. And even some of our friends may prove unfriendly or even unfaithful at times. Those kinds of friends are what Uh, a grandmother might call fair-weather friends. Jesus is a sure friend upon whom we can depend. Uh, We go the extra mile to make sure nothing comes between us and our earthly friends. If we take measures to maintain a friendly status with fickle folks, it should be with the same energy that we strive to keep the commands of our Savior. There is no Uh, not a friend like the lowly Jesus. The Greek word translated friend in the context of today's lesson literally means a friend at court and a groom's best best man. It is a close relationship. As Christ's friends, we do not have to compete for his attention. He shares secrets with us and we can pour out our hearts to our true friend, Jesus. The Lord informs us that this special friendship did not just happen haphazardly happen we were chosen we did not choose him he chose us to bear fruit that he has planted in each of our hearts he chose us to do his will Jesus repeats his message of love by reminding us of the most important commandment of all to love one another How good and pleasant it is in the sight of God to see us as friends loving him and loving one another as we strive to expand his kingdom. So the question is asked, in what ways would our church members and ministries be changed for the better if we place love at the center of our personal lives and the life of our churches? That is a very good question. We would have such bond, such unity, such fellowship. There would be no place for the devil. He would be immediately evicted. There would be no confusion. We would be able to settle our disagreements in the word of God. I recently talked to a lady and I was explaining some things to her about how uh, essentially ask the question how do we settle disputes how do we cure that type of situation if both of us are right but we can't get along how do we settle that dispute so the answer was the gospel of Jesus Christ the gospel settles the dispute the gospel settles the argument The commandment settles the confusion. If we adhere to the word of God, if we humble ourselves under it, and we do better at obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, the results and the fellowship would be priceless. We have yet to enjoy the fruit that we could have because 
Sadly to say, so many of us are unwilling to obey even the gospel that we quote. But here's the thing. If we would but for a moment remember that Jesus said it. It's in your Bible and it's in red. Jesus said, do it. Jesus said, that's what he wants. Jesus said, that's how it should go. Jesus said, I'm showing you how to. I'm not just telling you to do. So these are very, very, very important issues for us as a church, as a people, as a society, as a culture. Going forward, we are missing out on the love. We are missing out on so much because we would rather kill than love. We would rather hate than forgive. I think it's interesting in the third chapter of John, you can read it for yourself, that Jesus says these words, it's in red, men love darkness rather than the light. Can you imagine? We would rather be in darkness than see where we're going. We would rather remain hard-hearted than to become sensitive to the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to leave you with Galatians chapter 6 because there is a scripture that is very familiar to me and I love to read it because things happen to us and we think that uh, we are exempt from things happening to us. And we don't know how to handle people who have had uh, weaknesses and shortcomings. And we seem to think that it was exclusive to them and not to us. But I want to read this to you and then we're going to have prayer and then we'll close. Galatians chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. Brethren, if, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. It goes on to say, but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for each one shall bear his own load but I want to go to another familiar verse down uh, at verse 9 in that same chapter, 6th chapter of Galatians. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That is the verse I want to pin tonight as we close and I want you to think about especially especially to those do good especially to those who are the household of faith in other words your brothers and sisters in Christ pray with me now Father in the name of Jesus we thank you for this opportunity and this privilege to be able to share such a word today and Father, as I read and as I study, I'm, I'm also humbled by my frailties and, and seek your forgiveness even now as I pray for others and I lift my own actions in prayer. For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God who forgives us of, of our sins and cleanses us from our unrighteousness and father we are asking you tonight to help us to keep these commandments 
that Jesus told us about. Help us to love one another. Help our hearts and our minds. Uh, we have been wounded by one another and we are not able, some of us, to go forward. But we need you and we can't get along without you. Help us now. Help us in our homes. Help us in the church houses. Help us in our communities. Help our leaders to guide us in the way that these commandments are teaching us to go and we are praying for those who have fallen back and fallen short and fallen down and some have fallen away give us a mind to come back that we might receive these principles even yet again that we might have willing hearts and willing minds to obey we thank you for Jesus who was the uh, uh, supreme example of love toward us and toward you and giving his life and shedding his blood for our sins. We just thank you for such a powerful lesson today. And let it be a blessing uh, wherever it should fall. Let it be a blessing in the hearts and the minds of your people today. We are so thankful to be able to be given instruction that whereby we could live and we could learn and we could obey. And we might receive the blessing that you promised according to your word. Father, we thank you now. We call it done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I certainly love you all. And I certainly love being able to present this lesson to you. Let us learn. And let us do better. And so again until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again. We say God bless you.